For years, I've enjoyed immersing myself into characters that are tough, compassionate, and righteous. One of my most memorable roles was portraying Denver Bull Randleman in the HBO miniseries, Band of Brothers. Hi, I'm Michael Cudlitz. The character of Bull was not only a gateway for me into understanding what those soldiers went through during World War II, but it also encouraged me to honor and perpetuate the sacrifice in any way I could, even after the camera stopped rolling. This is the story of the 93rd Bomb Group, the most traveled, most colorful, most efficient, most highly decorated bomb group of World War II. Their base was called Hardwick Aerodrome 104. This story is dedicated to those men and women who called Hardwick home during the dark days of World War II. We hope this film has renewed memories for the survivors and their families and created a memorial to the 93rd Bomb Group and those who have fallen but are not forgotten. Returned to Hardwick in January 1975. It was late in the afternoon, just before sundown. As I entered into the old briefing building, I found it was being used to store farm equipment. Yellow sunlight struck a musty old door. It was covered with layers of gray-brown damp dust. Wiped it off. The words underneath? 93rd Bomb Group. Her old insignia was visible through a translucent film of grit. Hardwick had been converted into a potato farm. Several crop duster biplanes were parked on what had once been a concrete tarmac. Bulldozed. The other two were intact. Years of alternating freezing and hot weather, rain and sun had left only crumbled cement and loose stones, where once lumbering old libs rolled up and down undulating ribbons of concrete. where I punched in for duty. The stink of detonated gunpowder seeping through our oxygen masks. The spent brass cartridges tinkled and clanged to the deck and cascaded over the radio table. And up in the turrets, the jackhammer metallic vibration rattling and shaking the deck below the Martin upper turret, behind the cockpit, aloft and forward of the bomb base. A piece of panoply of long-winged lips in lofty box formations. We hoped and trusted the resultant concentration of firepower from staggered echelons would make us invulnerable to fighters. It was a trade-off that made us easy marks for the puffy stuff that resembled black ink blotches silhouetted against the sky. And so, these events revisited me on my lone return to Hardwick. 
where I stood in the old, darkened, cobwebbed ready room, thirty years after the stuff from which memories are made. It was good for us old guys to remember and to share our memories with and of each other. We're the only ones who can really understand why we did what we did. And then proudly proclaim to all who care, I'm glad I did it and know for sure I could not do it again. Bystander at the beginning of the war, the attack on Pearl Harbor forced the United States to come up with a plan to defeat the Axis powers and help Europe and other parts of the world regain control from Germany, Italy, and Japan. Graduation day as fledgling pilots sprout wings for Uncle Sam. 400 students are completing their course today, the first group of thousands being trained by the Army to bolster our Air Force. January 1942 marks the beginning of the United States' 8th Air Force. Many other numbered units would be created and assigned all over the world, but the 8th was designed to operate predominantly over Europe. At the beginning of World War II, the senior leaders of the country, both military and civilian, knew that we were going to need a large numbered Air Force to take the war to Nazi Germany. It began from very meager means. They had uh, a long period of time when they didn't have many aircraft. Their first combat mission, they had to fly with borrowed uh, aircraft from the Royal Air Force, but it gradually built up the fighter forces and the bomber forces to where it became really a second front. The daylight bombing offensive against Germany is the responsibility of the 8th Air Force. Under the 8th Air Force are the 8th Bomber Command, the 8th Fighter Command, and the 8th Air Service Command, all of whom contribute to every bombing mission. At the start of the war, Hitler's relentless aerial blitzes ravaged cities like Warsaw, Rotterdam, Manchester, and London. Ruthless bombing of London, the German war machine threatened to invade Britain. King George and Queen Elizabeth become the royal symbols of British resistance. In desperate retaliation, the Royal Air Force conducted nighttime raids over Germany, employing area bombing, which indiscriminately targeted large swaths of enemy territory. The first all-American bombing operation against Nazi-occupied Europe begins in England. American factories and American workers built these planes. Now they are ready to face the test of action. When the Americans arrived in 1942, the 8th Air Force decided to implement strategic daylight bombing. These raids, riskier without the cover of darkness, would only target chemical plants, aircraft engine plants, and other industrial areas vital to Germany's war effort. To the British and the rest of the Allies, the arrival of the United States and its air power was a welcome relief to an already war-torn Europe. It was around 1941, we heard rumors that they were going to build air bases around here. So uh, I got excited because I was always interested in aircraft. I used to cycle up here and watch the airfield being built. 
all the big bulldozers and everything. And gradually the aircraft came and, um, well, it's so exciting for us boys. We'd never seen anything like that before. I thought it was a very large place. I had never been on airfields before. And I just didn't know what I was getting into. Well, we arrived there, we were basically just dumped in in a strange place among a bunch of strange people. And uh, we knew the 93rd was one of the older groups, but uh, we didn't know anybody or anything like that or the layout. We had to learn everything from square one. I was a farm boy and uh, lived through the drought and depression years of the of the 30s. So my experiences, these were all new experiences for me. You know, when you walk around the airfield in general, you see buildings and this, but when you stand at the end of the runway, you immediately know where you're at. If you look down, this is runway 32 and it's full width and almost the full length. runways scarred the landscape of East Anglia. They look like an A from the air. Three runways gives you six directions of landing depending on what direction the wind is coming. So imagine the control tower right in this area. This was a key point to observe all the happenings on the field. I remember we used to stand and watch when the planes come in and they count and see how many are coming back. Everybody sweated out. When you see planes missing, you know, you wonder who, who it was, was who, who went down. Hardwick's tower was demolished many years ago, but we're lucky in the fact there's a tower of the same shape and size at Shipton. By walking around that tower, you get a feel for what the tower at Hardwick would have been like and how big it was. This would have been an interesting place to be 70 years ago. It would have uh, been a hive of activity. You'd, ha you'd had radio operators, telex, messages going backwards and forwards between the different people. But this is where they would stand and wait, wait and watch for the planes to return. I entered the service on a lie. I lied about my age. I was 16 when I went into the cadet program and I was flying a bomber on our way to Berlin when I was 18 with a full crew. I think that the main thing I remember about the war is the bonding that takes place when there's only 10 of you that go to work every day and do your job every day and survive every day, something happens that will never disconnect. Most of us like to go to a place where we will learn more about ourselves than we thought we knew. We always pick a spot where somewhere along the line, our trail, I'm talking about the 8th Air Force trail and our own bomb group trail, travel. We like to go back and see what was left behind. It's a little bit different. Still got two seats up there, though. Eighth Air Force still exists. It's, and it's the oldest numbered Air Force because it started before the Air Force even was born. The 93rd flew more B-24 missions than any other B-24 outfit. So now that history from World War II is our legacy. We live it still today. I want to be someplace where if it wouldn't be for us, it wouldn't exist. I'd rather be there, OK? so. 
So I tend to, and so do our guys, tend to want to find that place that needs us. And that's why we have Harvard. Hello. Hello, Colin. How are you? I'm good. How's things with you? Good, good. From the time I was a very small child, I can't remember when I started pestering my grandfather, Melvin Morrison, you know, what he did in the war. I wanted to know the planes he flew on and then where they were at on the base and where he lived on the base. That's the direction of the one secondary runway. My training is a mechanical engineer and it's just the way I've always looked at things. You know, I always love getting into the details and understanding how things work. We all kind of got to believe that we're getting older. I know we don't like to think about that, but we need to define the mission that we would like to see go forward when we're not always able to attend. One of the objectives is to assure that the deeds of the men who served with the 93rd during World War II won't be forgotten. And that's what we're trying to recreate in our return to Hardwick. My grandfather flew 30 missions starting in March of 44 to the end of September 44, so over about a seven month period. He has passed away, but keeping the memory alive, I think it's very important. Don Morrison, he probably knows more about the 93rd at Hardwick than anybody else alive today. And he's worked closely with a Brit named Colin Mann, his trusted advisor, we spend every minute we can together researching the airfield. If he gets a chance to come to England, there's nothing we like better than getting into some old clothes and getting in and out some grubby ditches searching for bits of planes. It's hard to sum up how a reunion like this will impact somebody, but it brings the past alive in a way that you can't do in any other way. It's extraordinary. All right, my friend, you keep safe. All right. If changes, I'll be in touch. All right, you too. Talk to you later. When I was growing up, I always considered my dad the smartest guy I knew. He was always very good at math and science. So I'm really not surprised that when he enlisted into the Army Air Corps, that he was chosen to be uh, a navigator. My father passed away when I was 15. He was only 45. And, and he never talked about his experiences during the war. And so when I was growing up, I only had these little snippets and bits and pieces. And I, I've always felt um, uh, that I missed out on that part. Hardwick is located in the southern part of England. If you look on a map, go northeast of London, approximately 100 miles, that would be kind of the center of a hub where East Anglia is, and Norwich would be the largest main town in the middle of that. Everybody would look forward to R&R. &R. Most men would go off base for it in Norwich. The, the club that most guys will tell you about, which they remember, was the Samson and Hercules, which was across from the cathedral. They'd go there to meet the local ladies, have a drink, and generally relax. Once I had found out that my dad was associated with the 93rd, sent in my money to become a member and started receiving the newsletter. And immediately I felt that here it was. I was, I was now on, a member of the family. I had always wanted to visit a hard work as part of my bucket list. And here was a perfect opportunity. This library is an official memorial to those young men that, that didn't make the journey back home. And um, we're here to try and keep the memory of them and all the veterans that came here to England during World War II. It was never clear what had happened to my Uncle Bob at, and what caused the crash and uh, all the circumstances surrounding it. That what they told the family 
at the time was very sketchy. They basically just told them that he was killed in action and there was a plane crash in England. But that started us on this desire to find out what had happened. He was killed in a crash on December 19th of 1944 at Hardwick. We didn't know that until much later. Loved the idea that you could continue to get more and more information. It's one of the things that keeps me coming back to the 93rd is this wanting to understand more. They were about a mile and a quarter, a mile and a half from the end of the runway and they crashed. We met Leland Spencer. He had never been to a reunion since I had been there. And he said, well, he said, I didn't know your uncle, but I knew about the crash. So hopefully we find out more about what had happened to my uncle at this reunion. You expect young men to go off to war, uh, but you don't expect young women to go off to war. She told me when I asked her why, mother, would you want to leave the States and go to war in the middle of that huge, dangerous time? And she said, for adventure. She was a professional secretary in Detroit, Michigan. She worked for the Detroit Edison Company and felt the call that she wanted to go, applied and applied and applied through the Red Cross. She was hired and was able to go. Mother darling, and so I have settled down at long last on an airfield somewhere in Britain. Once in a while, I find it hard to believe that thousands of miles of ocean are between me and my beloved USA. As I got older and began to want to learn more and more, we had photographs and uh, actually letters that were written home that I would go through. The officers and men on the field are fine, and I've been made to feel very much at home in the few days I've been here. Little by little, I'm growing to know them better, and now when I go into the snack room crowded with servicemen, there are lots of, hi Helens, and offers of chairs at various tables. Since I'm so newly arrived, it is very gratifying. The Red Cross discouraged women going over and getting married. Somehow, I would imagine an attractive young woman would have been seen by one of the, one of the officers there, and um, someone noticed her. When we first landed, I remember we were going into the dining hall around noontime, and an A-20 buzzed the base. And uh, he uh, got too low and too fast, and his one wing clipped the telephone pole. He augured in, and the pilot was killed. We found out later he was celebrating. He had finished his tour in Europe. He was going to go back to the States. And that was our first experience with what war would be like. By September 1942, the group arrived in England. The 93rd was the first B-24 equipped bomber group to reach the 8th Air Force. By the fall of 1942, the 93rd was involved in Operation Torch. The commanding officer, Dwight D. Eisenhower, needed air support for an invasion into North Africa to push the Axis powers out. We traveled all over Africa and we lived in, in very primitive conditions. When we were out in the middle of the Sahara Desert, we lived in tents. All of our food was canned and dehydrated. You can't imagine how hot it was. Each of us received a ration of one canteen of water a day. They were tasked with bombing targets deeper into Southern Europe, overtaking Italy and reaching as far north as Austria. 
After the 93rd returns to Hardwick after their second deployment, they pick up the nickname Ted's Traveling Circus. And this is interesting because, first of all, they probably deployed and traveled more than any other B-24 unit in 8th Air Force. One thing that we found early on from when the group was uh, first formed is many of the pilots were pre-war pilots. They all commented that they were really uh, kind of ahead uh, above the rest. And, and even going back into the first commander, Ted Timberlake, uh, many of the veterans said that uh, that he had just that magic that turned uh, the 93rd into a very uh, legendary group. While the 93rd was still in England before their second deployment to Africa, something interesting happened. The crews were directed to fly low-level missions. They didn't understand this because every time they went across the English Channel, they would be at high altitude for their protection. So why were they flying at low level? They had a had a briefing for each mission. They finally told us where we were going. Our radio operators, he said it was a 1,200-mile trip, a round trip. So he said, well, by golly, I'm, he got a map and he measured 1,200 miles from, said exact, and it was exactly uh, Romania. On August 1st, 1943, during their second deployment to North Africa, the 93rd was one of five B-24 bomb groups involved in a top secret mission called Tidal Wave. The objective was to fly over the Alps into Albania, down into the plains of Ploesti, Romania, and attack oil refineries which provided a large amount of oil production for Nazi Germany. We'd been trained for the low-level Ploesti raid. They had trained us for it, and we couldn't get away from that. So while we were down North Africa, I flew number 25, 26, 27, then Ploesti, and then I came home. They picked key points within the complex, and they said, if we can hit these particular points, we will cripple this facility. It will be very difficult to repair. They were going to go calm out, drop down low level so that they would be underneath the radar of the Germans. That was the plan. That's not what happened. We flew maybe 12,000 feet for a while, you know, until we got to start coming down, you know, when we got to the target. It, it was uh, anywhere from 500 feet down to 150, 200, off the low. When we were flying, you could see houses right on each right, and they were shooting at us from both sides. Of we dropped lower and flew faster. A city lay ahead. Co pilot Podersky shouted, It's Bucharest. God, we turned too soon. As the first two groups enter the target area, they're supposed to fly over three cities and then make a turn to the southeast to ingress to the target area. Unfortunately, the lead bomb group turns after the second city rather than the third. As the two groups continue to fly south, the 93rd realizes they're not on the correct heading they turn back toward the target area. Now, in the meantime, the last three groups correctly fly over the three cities. You got this mass mingling of aircraft. A lot of targets are not hit. Aircraft are destroyed. Everybody egresses just to get out of the target area. Well, you know, it was follow the leader. And then going into the target, we went in six abreast behind each other. And we didn't hit our assigned target, but the one we hit was who I never put back in use again, because we hit it, and the, and the group behind us hit it, too. Flashes and black. Oily columns of smoke revealed where circus ships had already dropped. I realized we'd be crossing at 50 feet over gas storage tanks. The knot in my stomach tightened another notch. A liberator ahead of us was hit, and streams of scarlet flame came from waste windows. A bomb exploded and a gas storage tank arose into the air between two of our planes. I saw another ship go into a black cloud, but never come out. Colonel Baker's plane was on fire. He pressed the attack. Then his ship somersaulted to the ground in a flaming skid. With navigational errors and extensive German defenses, 
the Ploesti raid would end up being a strategic failure for the United States. 178 B-24 Liberators flew the mission, only 88 returned to bases in North Africa. A total of 45 planes were lost, and the remaining either crash-landed or limped into other countries. Out of 1,620 airmen, 446 would be killed or missing in action, 130 wounded, and 79 interned. Up until the Ploesti mission, no other military force was as highly decorated. Every airman on the raid received the Distinguished Flying Cross, dead, alive, or in captivity. Fourteen Distinguished Service Crosses and Silver Stars were given, and an astounding five Medals of Honor were awarded. Two of them posthumously to Lieutenant Colonel Addison E. Baker and Major John L. Juristad of the 93rd. North Africa had been cruel to the 93rd's men and machines during three special assignments. Expedition number two, Ploesti, the centerpiece, was ghastly in human terms. Pre- and post-Ploesti missions from the desert had been long and grueling. Heat, sand, and dust were defiant. Hardwick stay-behinds realized this return to England would be hazardous for overtaxed men and machines. Everyone turned out at Hardwick to welcome the valiant, frazzled, and bedraggled desert rats. This irregular parcel of County Norfolk was the closest to a second home they'd ever know. It's pretty remarkable when you think about it because there's nobody from the 93rd that's living at Hardwick. This is maintained by volunteers that are interested in their local history. For them, this is what happened to their country, their neighborhood during World War II. I think it was in 75, we went out and had a banquet out at the base. The local people had us there. We just visited with this family. And there's a young lady, I think she was a first year of college, or she's in college anyway, we met. And she was telling me things about the 93rd that I didn't know. I kept in touch with um, several air crew for quite a number of years. This is the folder of Sarah Virginia Douglas. I help trace to the family um, back in America. They study that stuff. They really were appreciative. This is the individual airplane. We met John Archer, and he talked to my sister and I about his time during the war. He showed, he showed my sister a logbook. I was 14 years old. I started doing these diaries when I started to see uh, various aircraft in the in the area. He would count the number of planes that took off from Hardwick, and at the end of the day, he would count the number of planes that returned. It goes to show you just how much the base meant to him and, and the guys that uh, served there meant to him, that he would keep track of that. When they first came, people resented the Americans slightly with their good uniforms and their strange voices. But slowly, I think they realized that these were young men, the same ages as their sons, that were already overseas fighting a war and putting their lives at risk every day. As soon as people realized that, then they were accepted into the community. And that's when the love affair that still goes on here started. The museum is based in three missing huts that uh, would have originally been crew quarters. You would have had two crews to each hut. Along the top of the, uh, the hut here, we have uh, news outs from all the uh, different bases. My name is Paul Thrower. I am the uh, curator for the 93rd Bomb Group Museum. In this cabinet, we have the bombardier and navigators uh, section. Some of the guys in the States, I've been corresponding with them, and it's led on for them to send items to the museum. 
uh, later on when they grow, grow in confidence that we're going to look after them. This one is shown inside what there's like in and this and that. Boy. One of the guys who I contacted, Harry Tower, he was a, a cartoonist. Every day he drew a scene on his female and sent home to his wife. I was sent just a small selection of these females. I mean, we learned so much from them because each scene was a daily scene, what he was doing in the day. And you can't believe how much we learned about the base. At the end of the Second World War, Hardwick, as a lot of airfields was, was stood down. It came up for sale, and David then bought it to turn it into a farm. This whole field looking out here would have been filled with buildings. There was such a good association with this East Anglian area, mm -hmm. where there was about 60 airfields all built within about a two-year period. David, he'll tell you he's a farmer, but he is also a veteran of World War II. After the war, he uh, wanted to go into farming. And this land was available, and it was the former airfield. It wasn't all the airfield, but it was a substantial part of the area that still had some structures on it. Let's hope associations like this from all people over here of your, your age group will continue to remember what happened all those years ago thing about it is when the Americans come over and they show appreciation of what we're doing, that's really, really good. Um, they love it that we're keeping the memories alive of what their families, friends, relatives did during the war. There are albums and albums of photographs inside the Nissen huts. People have sent in photographs over the years, letters over the years. This has all been archived together. And in flipping through the books, I look down at a page and I see a photograph of my mother and my father that I've never seen before. Dad was enrolled at Texas A&M University when the call came up. Back then, Texas A&M was a military school. As far as I know, he went straight to Hardwick. I believe that they left probably in early 42 they never even went home from college to see their parents. They went directly from campus and reported for duty. Here we go. Number one, it was a shocker to travel all the way across the Atlantic, land, get on a bus, go, open up a book. How many miles away from where I live? And there my, there's my mom and dad. And somebody has saved that. Somebody cares enough to save that stuff about our parents, about that generation. And now, to get to the really important part of this letter without further delay, I have, my sweet, fallen in the way of being in love. I kept telling myself it was the war, it was loneliness, it was anything but the real thing. But every time I saw him, there were little explosions of fireworks in my chest and my knees got weak. I guess now I better tell you the whole story right from the beginning. I'm not sure exactly how the whole dating thing began, but it did. Mother did write home to her mother and say, we, we need to keep this quiet because they will send me home if they know that, that I'm being distracted. I would suggest you tell the family and close friends the news, but not announce my engagement formally until I ask you to. Best that you presently have something hot to drink and lie down for a while. Heaps of love, HL. From my very first visit back at Hardwick, one of the challenges that I realized was trying to figure out where you were relative to what you were seeing.
When our group went back, this reunion, Leland Spencer was there, one of our veterans, for the first time since the war. And he was struggling like I struggled with, well, where am I? You know, what am I looking at? That's the taxiway that went down by the control tower. When he got to see the runway, and Don Morrison explained where they were relative to the other runways and showed Leland that. So the control tower would have sat out there. Yeah. Sorry. You would have looked out and saw the control tower. The control tower was over there. Yep, uh -huh. the control yeah. tower. It suddenly clicked for him. Yeah, I'm glad I got up. I just wanted to work my legs a little, and <laughs> here I'm seeing something. The hard stands weren't available. They didn't have B-24s parked on them or, and all that. But when I stood and looked at the runway, then I could visualize how it was. How old were you when you were here? 22. 22. Wow. Yes. We got talking with Leland about my uncle's crash on December 19th of 1944. That was the one that uh, I remember mm -hmm. yeah. as the bomb exploded. Okay, yes. When I first started investigating my uncle's crash, I was serving in the United States Army. I knew that there would be records that we would be able to uncover. There'd be people that would know what was going on. what was happening that day that resulted in my uncle crashing and being killed. On the 18th of December, when we checked the alert list, we were to fly. And in the morning of the 19th, they came in, they didn't call us out. They called another crew in the hut out. So we rolled over and went back to sleep. And a few hours later, we heard the explosion. We knew somebody crashed on takeoff and then shocked to find out that the crew was the guys from our hut. All of the crew were killed. There was no chance of surviving with all the bombs going off and all the fuel that was on the aircraft and so forth. When the plane crashed, it crashed about 900 yards away from the end of the runway. We flew over a couple of days later, and a bunch of the wreckage was still on the ground. In fact, we flew over the crash site for the rest of our missions. When it crashed, it created a crater that was eight feet deep. Parts of the plane were completely buried. One engine was found uh, a quarter of a mile away from the crash site. A group of local folks that investigate crash sites went and recovered my uncle's uh, flight jacket. Uh, which is in the museum in Hardwick. It's, there's not much of it, uh, but it's, it's clear that, that it was a flight jacket and they were able to identify it to him. I always felt like the story was as straight as it could be given what was available. And even today, we continue to hear new parts of the story. Over about where I see that hedge is probably the end of this yeah, runway. Yeah, the edge of the long runway. Leland said, I didn't know your uncle, but I knew about the crash. He said, I was one of the investigating officers. They sent me out to the crash site, and he said it was unclear what had caused the plane to crash. And in the process, several witnesses said it sounded like all the engines weren't running. That got them focused on, well, were the engines okay? And they went and inspected the engines right after the crash, and they were all operational. At the end of the investigation, they concluded that it was 50% pilot error and 50% uh, weather. Later, Leland went back to the States. He was an instructor, and he was working with some other instructors and one of them was talking about how there was this switch that if you turned the switch, it would shut off the magnetos for the engines. He said they actually showed him how it worked and that he was able to shut off the engines for an aircraft. Now he would say that it's possible that somehow that switch was triggered. He didn't say that conclusively that's what happened, but he never believed it could happen until this much later. 
more information, something new that I had never heard before. In 1994, on the 50th anniversary of my uncle's crash, we dedicated a cross. We located it at the end of the runway at Hardwick, where the plane took off. When the group went to visit the cross, um, it was my granddaughter Emma's third visit. Seeing that cross and reading what was written there uh, it had a really profound effect on me. And, but when I found out that the family was here, it was, uh, it was just over the top for me to be able to stand next to that cross with them. I'm so glad you're here. I want that to be a place where those girls and their children and their grandchildren will go to periodically to honor my uncle and his crew so that uh, they're not forgotten. That, that sacrifice they made is something real in the lives of our family. On an average mission, three o'clock in the morning is, it was usually the wake up time. The CQ would come in about anywhere between one and two in the morning. They had a sound system and every hut had a speaker in it. And the brand name of the equipment was Tannoy. Well, they called them Tannoys, would wake you in the barracks. And usually the charge of quarters, the CQ would come around and make sure everybody was up. Shine a flashlight in your face and tell you to get up and get dressed. The question to them was always, what's the gas load? <laughs> it was a 23, 25, or 2700 gallons. And I can still remember the expression on the pilot's face when they hear 2700 gallons. That, that was going to be, you're going to be gone all day. That's a long mission. On January 30th, 1944, the 93rd Bomb Group reached a milestone. 100 missions had been logged. Coming off of Munich, we ran into a big cloud formation. We had to break up. And we ended up at 12,000 feet with no other plane in sight. And we called a little friend, and we got an answer. And a P-51 brought us home. The whole thing that was a killer for us was the lack of protection when we went out on a mission. The Germans had long ago figured out that the fighter planes that were going along to protect us could only go so far and they had to turn around and go home. The minute our guys turned around and went home, man, did we have lots of German fighter planes coming after us and shooting the shit out of us. And then one day, this guy with a red tail shows up and he ain't going to be like it was, and that changed the game completely. Nothing changes the course of the war more than the introduction of the P-51 Mustang. It had the improved turbocharged engine. They had another internal fuel tank, plus they would carry external fuel tanks. So now the P-51s could take off from England, follow the bombers to the target, and oh, by the way, they also had time to go down and strafe and attack German airfields. The main objective of the 8th Air Force was to gain air superiority in the skies over Europe. The Allied powers agreed that the Luftwaffe, or German Air Force, would need to be destroyed or crippled before any large-scale land invasion could occur. 
On March 6, the 8th Air Force organized the largest raid to Berlin, sending up 730 bombers, which included 28 planes from the 93rd, its first official mission to the city. Escorting the bombers would be 796 fighters. My fifth mission was the first uh, all-out raid on Berlin, and uh, we lost two of our planes uh, out of the bomb group that day. The other two planes that went down were shot down by flak. There was nothing really a bomber formation could do about flak. It was a very large gun that was stationed on the ground that would shoot a shell up to the elevation of the bomber formation. And that shell would explode and throw shrapnel in all directions. This shrapnel could destroy engines, puncture fuel tanks, kill crew. If you had a close hit, it could blow wings off, sever tails. They'd set those fuses on those 88s to go off at that altitude and in that area. All those things burst and you flew through them. If you turned off of it, you, it was a useless mission because your bombs weren't going to hit the target. So on one of my missions, they had me standing in the bomb bay holding the door open so it wouldn't jiggle shut on the bomb run. And one of them shells exploded below me. I looked up in the holes in the middle of the ceiling. I went up and ran out the top of the plane and I didn't get no flak. The ground crews had to go out, assess the damage, make repairs, and those ground crewmen did that for years. Well, we really never spent that much time on the flight line except going and coming on a mission. I think that was more for the benefit of the ground people who, who earned it. I didn't appreciate what they were doing at the time. Our father was the ranking engineering officer over the whole 93rd group when my dad went to Pratt & Whitney School. It would take a cruise of 20 to 30 guys, change out one engine, it would take them over 24 hours. By the time they got over in England, a cruise of five guys could change an engine in four hours. Dearest, the weather has been swell the last few days. And as you probably heard, over the radio or read in papers, our aircraft visited Berlin yesterday in great strength. It was some sight to see them go out and return in mass. As I was asleep in my room one night, there came a rap at the door, and I went, I got up and went to it, and it was a, a messenger. General Eisenhower wants you to know that tomorrow is the day. So I, 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 this really woke me up. I just couldn't sleep the rest of the night. Briefing at 2300 for 36 crews, half our force. Briefing at 0230 for 12 more. For several days, everyone has sensed impending life or death on a grandiose scale. The combat boys talk quietly. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. On June 6, 1944, Allied forces initiated Operation Overlord. The invasion on the French coast of Normandy would be the largest seaborne invasion in history. Five sectors were established on a 50-mile stretch of the coastline. The Americans were to advance through sectors Utah and Omaha. General Timberlake, we got together and he said, well, what you need to do is plan the bomb loads and the gas load to whatever missions that we were going to fly. Because the 93rd was tasked with four missions, they actually took off at staggered times during the day. We took off quite early, flew to the target area, but because of clouds and uh, 
not being sure where the troops were. They scrubbed it, and the pilot said, you want to go back or you want to tag along with somebody else? So he said, we're here, let's just tag along. They've been doing strategic bombing, long-range missions from high altitude. Now they're going to go in a fighting environment where troops are on the ground, and they've got specific targets, gun locations, some road intersections that they had to attack and bomb. So it was about 11 o'clock at night when we got back to base. As we went in to take off our flying clothes, the other guys were putting theirs on to go. The Allied forces have nearly three million troops trained for the assault, and British and U.S. planes bomb the French coast around the clock. D-Day will stand in history as one of the greatest military feats of all time. Reaching their 200th mission on June 17, 1944, the 93rd would return to strategic targets deeper into Germany. They would also participate with trucking missions into parts of liberated Europe, bringing much needed food, medicine, ammunition, and gasoline for both allied military and civilians. In September of 44, the 93rd assisted in Operation Market Garden, a plan developed by the British and eventually accepted by the Americans it would send Allied forces to the eastern reaches of the Netherlands. The airborne operation wings toward the Eindhoven, Nijmegen area of Holland with supplies and reinforcements following initial landings of the first Allied airborne army. Troops encountered fierce fighting with the Germans. Eighth Air Force units, including the 93rd, were called upon to parachute much needed equipment and supplies to ground forces. By November 25th, 1944, the 93rd would clock 300 missions. The approaching winter would be brutal, and reaching almost another 100 missions by the end of the war seems unfathomable. The buildings that come towards this is going deeper into the woods. Don told us that this was the location where the officers' quarters were, and this was the place where they would be picked up before they went over to the airfield for their mission. So on one end is a staircase, which if you come up here, you can see it. He had told us that there were bunkers there, which I thought was amazing that they would still even be there after all of this time. That shelter was there, and the men would have used it in the event of an enemy attack. When you go in there today, you're in the same space that they occupied all those years ago. One of the women that was on the trip with me was looking for the location of where her father's actual hut was. My father, Paul Steichen Sr., was a navigator with the 93rd Bomb Group. It really was the major part of his life in his later years. Got very involved with the bomb group. We're probably getting back close to like this hut here. Walking around today, you don't get a true picture of it because it's now forest, really. But there was nissen huts from one end of a field to another. It should be about that okay. way. We're like getting right in this yeah. corner. So it's right in this area. When he was turning 80, the whole family was coming over to Hardwick. He passed away shortly before that. Well, it's very emotional to be here. I don't know what else to say about it, but just to be on the spot where his hut was and to have been able to find it. It was really great that after she had come all this way, that she could actually stand where he had been. Yes, yes, this is where his hut was, so. Wow. It really is the point of this whole experience. Being here on Hardwick, I knew that, that the chapel was somewhere close. I have a picture at home of them just stepping out of the church right after they got married. And they have their heads ducked and big smiles and they're throwing rice all over them. You know, Don and Colin have such a close relationship with this community and people who care about this base. 
that they actually have approached the people that own the chapel where my parents were married. And I think I'm gonna get to go in. really excited, a bit nervous. I wasn't really sure how she'd react to us because we hadn't met her. Oh, oh sorry. No, it's <laughs> lovely. No, it's lovely. Yeah, we've been I, I can't, I can hardly believe this. Our wedding plans are complete. By the grace of God, and I mean that very reverently, we should be married on the 10th of May. Wish us luck and keep your fingers crossed. These are difficult and uncertain days so far. However, in spite of worry, there is one thing of which I'm very sure. No matter where I go, no matter where Charles goes, in the face of anything, he's the only one. During wartime, for my mother to have gone off into the unknown, just knowing I was standing the place that she stood um, and experiencing the things that she experienced for the first time, it was really amazing for me. We believe that about this area here, would be where your mother would have stood and your father would have been here. We've got the minister who is standing standing here. So I'm this in is the your, spot. You're in the spot here. Yes, you're yes. right there. <laughs> you are right in the spot. I could look over to the right and I could see in the photographs that I had of them, the windows. And off to my left, now it's the kitchen in the house. Since seeing the photographs, well, it's given me a sense of living in a somewhere where people worshipped, people were emotional, they cried, they laughed, there were funerals and weddings. How in the world this all came off that two cousins and my father's best friend were all able to come in for this ceremony. It was just wonderful, a crazy, wonderful thing. When they did get married, she just stayed about six months and then they sent her back stateside. Even though mom and dad have both passed on, through my participation with the 93rd Bomb Group, I've gotten closer and closer connected with my parents. So when it was time for me to go, I didn't want to leave. Um, there's something about, about Hardwick. I admit it feels like home. I think you, you're going to miss the routine that you went through for so long. It, you, it was part of your life. I was feeling glad to be leaving, especially to go back to the States. We're reminded today on these sacred grounds that the pursuit of freedom, liberty, and peace often come at a high price. You probably are scared to death, but you're too proud to show it. And the worst thing that could happen to you was let your buddy down. You're, you're, going to, you're going to miss leaving the guys behind. There was one thing you had, you're going to leave them behind. All around this region of England are airfields from which U.S. aircraft and their crew flew the missions that were so critical in bringing the war in Europe to a successful conclusion. The annual Memorial Day commemoration at the American Military Cemetery at Cambridge is the defining event. Indeed, my privilege to be here on this day, a day we set aside to remember those who fought and fell on our behalf.
as always, very moving. The cemetery itself is one of the most beautiful I've ever been at in the world. And it is a fitting tribute to uh, the sacrifices that were made by my uncle and his crew and all the men and women that are buried there. John had told me that this is a cemetery where his uncle is buried. So he and his grandchildren went off to find the headstone. So I went with them. Well, this is where you have to come every five years for the rest of your life. <laughs> it's wonderful that his grandchildren want to be there. And the fact that they want to be there just makes you understand why the 93rd exists. Well, I hope he knows that I'm here. It would have been something to have him here with us. It would have been something to actually know him growing up as an adult, something I miss dearly. I think he would have enjoyed it. I think he would have been reliving those times and, and thinking about what it meant for him to be here then. But I hope he knows that we're here and I hope he knows that we uh, are here to celebrate his spirit and to do our part in thanking him and, and all the other members of the 93rd and 2nd Air Division folks who were here at that time doing what they did. They all deserve our thanks. Very cool to see that P-51, boom, right over us. I certainly don't believe this is the last trip to Hardwick. These are all wartime buildings right here. Granted, it was only 30 of us Americans this time. We spend three, four days together, eating together, going to Norwich, traipsing around England. So all of a sudden, the vegetation wrestling and pew. Oh, what the? Oh. I never even saw what went by. <laughs> Apparently, it was a, a small deer. It's just really important to help keep the memory of the vets alive. We want them to have something as a memory that shows exactly how little it took working together to turn the corner. The fact that the people will show up at the level that they will show up, and when you see them and they see you, the first thing they want you to know is, we would have never made it if it wasn't for you. And they'll tell you in so many words, well, we can't keep saying it because we're going to go bye-bye. But the place can keep saying it. It can say it every year, every month, every time the family decides to go down and see where Grandpa was when, when the bad war was. The generations that come have to be kind of feel like they can understand it and they can respect it. If they don't do either, it's gone. And it's too important to support and re maintain than it is to just let it go. As 1945 approached, the road to victory for the Allied powers would not be easy. German ground forces would attempt one last major offensive campaign known as the Battle of the Bulge. Fighting would continue for more than a month during what would prove to be one of the coldest winters on record. Eventually forcing the Germans to retreat, Allied ground forces would continue to push through Europe, crossing the Rhine River on March 7th and reaching Berlin by that April. Along with Germany's formal surrender on May 7th, Allied forces would soon discover Hitler's systematic genocide of some six million European Jews and millions of others in German concentration camps. News of the Holocaust would shock the world. The United States 8th Air Force completed its last bombing mission on April 25, 1945. 
The 93rd Bomb Group would participate that day and record their 396th mission, far more than any other bomb group in the entire 8th Air Force. I was just 18, uh, and I wanted to, and like a lot of Midwesterners, I was going by the old axiom, uh, join the Navy and see the world. So I went into the Navy recruiter and discovered I'm partially colorblind, and they wouldn't have any part of me. So I walked across the hall and joined the Army and ended up in the Air Corps. I was uh, recalling that one occasion where we were watching the planes return. Uh, quite often you would see the red flares being fired to indicate that they had wounded aboard. But on this one occasion, as the plane landed, it must have jarred loose one of the bombs. And in, in this occasion, it was a, the 2,000 pound bomb. And it slid down the runway along with the airplane and everybody that was standing anywhere near there was running for their life for fear of explosion, but the, the uh, plane, the bomb never exploded. But I remember the evenings at the Red Cross Club, there'd be English women there who would uh, make sandwiches and toast them, and uh, two kinds of sandwiches, and one was, I'm sure, was um, cheese, the other was kind of a meat spread, and uh, we had them nicknamed hog jowls and turkey innards. <laughs> the interesting thing was they always had told us, even in pre-flight and navigation school, that the most undesirable thing to have before a flight was hot dogs. And that seemed to always be the hurry up meal before we went on a mission. We have a total of 76 93rd type people. Of that, only 20 are veterans. So that means 56 are from the younger generation. And I think that's just great. Yes. 